Okay, we're in. So welcome everyone um, to Lyft Economy's um, introduction around our MBA interactive webinar to answer your questions around cohort three of our Next Economy MBA. And um, to give a brief overview, what we're gonna do today is, um, first we have one of our current MBA students on, Olive Watkins. Um, she's gonna share a little bit. Um, I'm gonna give just a brief uh, introduction to, the, um, to kind of what we're overviewing um, today. Then Olive will share for a little bit about her experience. Um, we'll go into an overview of a bit of the um, uh, core offerings that we're covering in the MBA. Um, and then we'll save some time for uh, question and answers. Um, my name is Erin Axelrod. I'm a uh, worker owner partner at Lyft Economy. Um, and really why we had the intention to start doing this um, online, uh, nine month, um, highly accessible, kind of deep intensive about how to grow and scale and start um, social enterprises and how to intervene in, in the current economy um, was we because we saw so many of you and we had a lot of inquiries from a lot of the um, people in our network that um, just wanted to see um, learn more about our approach to business design and business development um, that they couldn't get through a one-on-one -on -one consulting engagement and so we we saw this as a kind of a, a more accessible extension of our offerings that we were doing um, that we do on a daily basis with hundreds of next economy companies um, and so uh, the roles that we see many of you might fit yourself into kind of these overarching categories that we see people looking to um, interface with this next economy um, many of you might be job seekers so you are currently dissatisfied with the work you're doing in the world maybe you um, are just dissatisfied with the the jobs that are out there that are um, in seeking to make deeper change so you might be a job seeker um, you may be um, an entrepreneur yourself or someone who wants to be um, working with entrepreneurs, maybe consulting. Um, so you may have more of a spirit of um, starting your own uh, project, being a solo entrepreneur or a part of a worker-owned collective, but you may be imagining something that's not yet um, manifested on the planet, um, and that might be the role that you see yourself in. Um, you may be already working in a company and the company might have next economy elements, um, but you might see yourself as looking for more tools to equip you um, to make bigger change, bolder action, um, bolder values alignment within that existing company. Maybe it's even a B. Did we lose Aaron or is it me? Oh, it looks like Aaron's uh, uh, video might have frozen for a moment. Um, so yeah, like she said, it might, you might even be at a B Corp. So part of this might be you're an existing organization and the MBA might give you skills for continuing the transition of the existing organization to have deeper layers of impact, you know, as you explore your vocational pathway. Or maybe another role that Aaron may have mentioned or not yet is being uh, an investor. We have a number of people who take the uh, Next Economy MBA training who want to find out how to play a bigger role um, at every level of investment, whether that means investing with our consumer dollars, if you're a consumer and consuming goods and finding out how to discern what are the best opportunities for goods and services that actually do have a beneficial impact on life, um, or maybe as an investor with retirement money or whatever access to resources you might already have um, or might someday have. So all those different roles come into play with the motivations for people taking the Next Economy MBA. And the, our, our kind of core thesis right now is that uh, through a protracted kind of nine-month learning of templates and opportunities to do 
uh, work, if you will, uh, in any one of those roles to advance and integrate your learning uh, from the MBA training so that it can be transformative in your life. And our secret little purpose to doing the MBA training is we want to grow a network of allies that uh, as we see opportunities and resources that we can direct them uh, so that we can see more growth of the initiatives that lift holes for our vision for a world that works for everyone with no one left out. Um, so with that, uh, as kind of a little preamble about what uh, the Next Economy MBA is all about, I'd love to maybe turn it over to you, Olive, if, if that's reasonable, just to hear from you as a current participant. Uh, we're a little bit, I guess, about halfway through, um, or maybe exactly halfway through uh, MBA Cohort 2, uh, which you're a member of, and I'm wondering if you'd like to share about your experience. Yes, I'd be happy to. Um, my name is Olivia. I prefer Olive. Um, it's nice to see all these interested people in this course. It has really been shifting the way that I think about business. Um, and it's something that I've definitely been seeking uh, for a while. I just kind of came to a point in my life where I realized that I had acquired a lot of really amazing skills. Um, I am a farmer. Uh, I also went to school to study environmental biology and science. Um, I also am involved in community organizing. Um, and for a while, I was kind of trying to figure out like, how to create a business or an initiative or a project that is making an impact in my community and on a larger scale. Um, it's economically su sustainable, so meaning that it's able to um, break even and pay me and other folks who are involved this, in a salary, um, but also like how do we do that without destroying our world? Um, and a lot of the, I guess, like business knowledge that's out there is currently serving the business as usual economy, um, which there are a lot of pros and cons and I was looking for alternatives that I could like mix in to be able to create a business that is running well and is also actually truly making impact um, versus saying like, we only, we donate like 10% of our proceeds each year. I just don't feel like that's enough. Um, and so um, by making an impact for me, it looks like how can we, you know, make an impact with the, the products or services and also how can we create a company culture where people really feel supported and we're like using language to help support one another, one another um, and transition the way that we like view works, work environments as collaborative versus competitive which is also another trait of business as usual economy, which I've just struggled with a lot in my life. Um, so that's, how, that's the framework that I'm working with. And that's where I came here. How I came here is um, being someone who's an entrepreneur um, and really passionate about um, being um, a force for good and like being a leader um, and um, also, like not realizing that I am probably not the best employee, so how can I employ myself in a way that is not extractive? Um, so I'm currently working on two projects right now. Um, my family, we have land um, that's been in our family for 130 years, and it's been uh, relatively mismanaged, and a lot of land has been stolen from us, um, and ultimately our family was driven off the land, so a part of my kind of journey um, is to uh, take on the management of this timberland and also um, grow different forest uh, products like mushrooms and berries and trees. Um, and uh, another project that I'm working on is called the Black Farmer Fund. And it is basically a fund that we are creating for black food businesses in New York to create a um, to create and support and invest in the local uh, black food business ecosystem. So whether or not that's farmers, restaurants, co-ops, distributors, um, we want this to be um, a way to facilitate some reparations. We also want this to be a way to uplift and center black folks in um, in communities that are doing really great work and that are under resourced. And so uh, realizing that I want to do this, these two really like impactful and important and sacred um, businesses um, 
I feel like I see often a lot of people who are like, who start out with good intentions and just kind of get like derailed because of um, people who come on and with investor money or um, pressures to uh, break even. And so um, pretty much my work that I have been doing with Lyft has been like really trying to define and get super clear on the vision and um, the vision and like the values and the goals. And so that's where we're currently at right now in the, in the uh, class. And it has been very helpful um, because I think I have a really good understanding of like how to run a business, um, but it can be very overwhelming when you're also trying to make a positive impact and create a business that isn't just gonna turn into um, something that further perpetuates the negative impacts of capitalism. So uh, one of the things that I'm, I like, am super grateful for is that um, Liv shares with us like basically a lot of documents on how they have created their business. So whether or not that's, um, we recently, I recently created a, like a vision uh, alignment document that's this eight page document of um, what our values are, what our mission is, what are different phases of development of our business, who do we want to involve in the business. And these are things that I kind of had a picture in my head as to how this was all going to happen, but it felt so overwhelming to put it down on paper. And I'm the type of person who needs some, like who needs templates and who needs guidelines in order to like really sit and think out every single piece and be in order to be super intentional um, with how I want to create my business. Um, and so that's something that we're currently working on. And we're also um, currently shifting into talking about creating business culture, which is I'm learning now is a super, super important reason, um, the thing to focus on. And one of the main ways that um, businesses often fail is because there's a lack of intentionality into culture. There's a lack of intentionality into like setting up really good communication systems. So all that is basically to say that I am usually the type of person who like has these ideas and goes for it. And sometimes they work and sometimes they don't, right? I mean, that's the whole point of entrepreneur, entrepreneurship. But this course has really given me um, a space to really be intentional on um, creating a business that is going to hopefully last uh, for a very long time um, and is also going to withstand um, any sort of um, potential challenges to its visions um, and its mission uh, because I've gotten really clear in, in what that looks like. Uh, so that's currently where we are, we are right now and um, where we're heading is uh, moving more so into talking about like strategy and talking about marketing and talking about financing which I'm really excited to learn about um, like alternative ways of doing that. Um, I think like when you think of financing your business, you automatically think of like getting loans or like selling part of your business, but there's other ways to do that. So I'm really excited to learn about that. Um, and also different strategies and different marketing um, tactics that aren't super like aggressive and like buy my product. Um, I'm really looking forward to learning about that as well. Um, so yeah, that's, yeah, that's what I have to say. If anyone has any questions or whatever, happy to answer. Erin, I see you're muted. I don't know. Thank you, Olive. That was really wonderful. And uh, Jonathan is chatting in. Thanks for sharing your story. Yeah, I really appreciate the courage and sharing. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks for a comprehensive kind of overview of the experience so far. Uh, the uh, just housekeeping for everybody on this uh, this call today there is a zoom chat and so you're welcome to voice your questions if you have them in real time if you can also type them in um, and we'll kind of make specific moments to pause but uh, you're welcome to at any time extemporaneously just put in your question I wanted to just um, this is Aaron thank you all and 
Olive, and thank you for your patience and happy equinox to folks. It's a rainy equinox here for me, and that's why sometimes my internet jumps in and out. But I just wanted to, um, Olive, um, some of the things you mentioned are, are relevant to what we wanted to share with, with folks, including, you know, um, culture as being the, the thing we're moving into during the current MBA and how so much of culture is, is um, under, underappreciated and overlooked and, and, and not managed for. And that's one of the, the key causes of business failure. So I really appreciate you bringing that in and the fact that you're um, focusing on that right up front is, is really uh, big and important. Um, and also vision alignment and goal setting. We see um, so many entrepreneurs have this, um, uh, this kind of implied or implicit vision, but it's not explicitly defined and it's not, um, it's, there's not intentionality around coming together and explicitly designing the vision um, together and making sure that everyone on your team is aligned. Um, and so that's one of the things, one of our fo focal points in the MBA, and we spend a good amount of time um, teaching teaching entrepreneurs how to achieve that. Um, and there are some tools and strategies and, and uh, ways of, of doing that that are more effective than others that we try to share. Uh, so thanks for bringing the, those two pieces and the, for the good work you're doing. Um, there are many, many more than just those two pieces you shared. So appreciating that. Great. Um, I'd love to, um, on the, for the agenda today, I'd love to kind of uh, turn towards uh, some of the terms and in, in we've been using this term, the next economy and the invitation to today. And it's something that Lyft Economy talks about quite a bit. And I wanted to kind of share maybe by contrast what we mean by the next economy and give some examples. So we contrast the next economy, which next Im implies the future, but it's actually here, um, just not very well distributed and not very well known. Uh, and we contrast it with the business as usual economy, or sometimes we refer to that as the exploitation economy, um, which if you look around our world today, tragically, we will have you know, 800 million people who will be malnourished or hungry today. And, um, equally as many people won't have adequate water supply or sanitation and we see the kind of destruction of the environment and existential crisis of our time with climate change and um, so the exploitation economy the, the norms of the economy which is represented by this line here kind of uh, we, we would suggest need to be transformed um, and we see some efforts to transform it that are kind of making the economy, business as usual economy, less bad. Uh, and it's as if it's a hospicing out of the existing economy. And simultaneously, we see people like Olive midwifing in the next economy that well, under new norms, new structures, uh, so structurally distinct from the outcomes that the business as usual economy creates. And so this image is meant to represent that there's this pathway of both hospice work and midwifery work happening simultaneously in our world. And part of the Next Economy MBA curriculum, if you will, is, as all have suggested, kind of helping us understand how to navigate the choices. Sometimes may be compromises, but the choices, how do we maintain our values uh, and actually have a going concern that can provide for our needs, for ourselves, our family, and our community so that we can give our gifts to the world. It's a very challenging kind of equation, and we've picked up a few things. And one of the things that we've learned from, from the organizations that we've had the privilege to support and work with, uh, coming up uh, over 150, maybe between 150 and 200 organizations that we've worked with at Lyft Economy over the last almost decade, is uh, a few principles that we see in kind of the whole expression of the next economy organizations. And they're listed here, there's 10 of them. And in the training, we kind of dissect these um, and give case studies and examples of expressions of these principles. And these principles become a reference point as we talk about any of the other nuts and bolts of operating uh, an enterprise, the, the marketing, the strategy, the enrollment sales type conversations, or even culture building, communication skills, or fundraising, that these principles can be applied 
um, uh, in the design of a next economy organization, whether again, you're an entrepreneur or a job seeker or in an existing organization already, looking at these principles becomes a way to uh, change and transform the very nature of the economy. Um, I'll maybe kind of reference these next economy principles as I share two examples of two organizations that are kind of indicative, um, again, organizations that we have the privilege of working with. The first one is actually a farm in Oregon. It's called Our Table. Um, it's in Sherwood, Oregon. It's a uh, multi-stakeholder cooperative farm, uh, about 60 some acres, biodynamic mixed vegetables, uh, some small animals, perennial berries, some tree crops, um, and flowers. And what makes our table, a ca the case study I want to share is its fairly unique uh, structure. Um, there's, as far as we can tell, less than uh, 15 or less than 20, certainly, uh, worker-owned cooperative farms in this country in total. Uh, which is an embarrassing statistic. Um, farming, as you know, in this country is loaded with uh, exploitation of labor. Um, and uh, so actually to have the workers be owners of the operation is an, a very critical distinction. But it's, our table didn't stop at having the workers be owners. They actually developed a regional network of producers in the Willamette Valley area that are also uh, a, a, a type of owner. And then the consumers in the region, um, the local population, um, are also owners. And so this multi-stakeholder structure is structurally distinct from the business as usual economy. But what it unlocks is uh, the potential for non-extractive financing to come in through the very ownership class, the various ownership classes, mitigation of risk, the risks that are normally associated with agriculture because you have this regional set of producers and goods sold, and kind of this mutual support. Um, and the, the structure itself unlocks potentials for um, fair wages for labor, uh, far uh, exceeding the, the, the norms of wages for um, uh, other farms in the region, or certainly other farms in this country. Uh, the pricing of the food, um, uh, kind of making it accessible, making really high quality nutrient dense food accessible. And it's, it's not only through their structure, it's also through their operational structure and that they do some vertical integration where they have a commercial kitchen, a uh, small commercial kitchen on site and a small storefront on site. So stacking up by design some of the supply web that's normally associated with the food system to get really lean and efficient as much as possible to make sure that people can have access to high quality nutritious food um, local food um, where the land and labor are actually uh, regenerative. Our favorite part about the Our Table uh, example, um, having these stakeholders gather around a table, sharing a meal, having a discussion about how much should we be paid, how much should the food cost. But our favorite example about Our Table, or one of the reasons we love it, is uh, is, is one 65-acre farm in Oregon going to change the economy? Obviously not. but Imagine a world in your mind's eye for a moment where there's 10,000 hour tables across the country, where this model is open sourced, regionally replicated, adapted to the local conditions. And all of a sudden you have a vision, a possibility of a totally different world. And all of the organizations that we tend to try and influence with the next economy principles would take on this character of open source, regionally replicable models that in aggregate, once federated and supporting each other and mutual support, change the very nature of the economy. Um, I'm gonna pause for questions before I share the next case study. Sean, Aaron, anything coming up in the chat? Okay. The next example I wanted to share case study is something called the East Bay Permanent Real Estate Cooperative. So not, not looking at farming now, but looking at housing, another critical human need. So food, housing, looking at core uh, human needs. Uh, East Bay Permanent Real Estate Cooperative, again, structure. Structure matters, both operating structure, how decisions are made and governance is played out, but also the actual legal and incorporated structure. The less known, I won't say completely novel, but the less known and less explored edges of uh, our uh, institutional systems, our, our legal statutes, 
become very important to explore in the next economy. The East Bay Permanent Real Estate Cooperative takes the best characteristics of a community land trust, uh, land without landlords, uh, providing permanently affordable housing, uh, anti-displacement, movement building, building power in communities, um, uh, and making it accessible to more people by structurally changing the way that the organization can access funds. So whereas a community land trust, which are fine and doing well in the world as a, as a structure, are limited because of their legal structure, being a multi-stakeholder cooperative structure like the East Bay Permanent Real Estate Cooperative unleashes this possibility. Um, so it's a partnership. Of, uh, there's a staff collective, the, Stain the Sustainable Economies Law Center, the uh, People of Color Sustainable Housing Network have come together to create um, a vision for a, a world where we have land without landlords um, and change the nature of the financing to actually build wealth in communities that have been historically marginalized and oppressed. Um, and build a democratic culture where we can make collective decisions together. Um, and it's a learning journey for humanity. And again, East Bay Permanent Real Estate Cooperative would be one instantiation of this model. But again, in your mind's eye, if you could imagine every community having a permanent real estate cooperative that over time transitions land from uh, the unjust uh, exclusive ownership um, of property by individuals uh, that have, you know, taken that land by force or through cultural institutional racism uh, uh, and uh, even genocide, depending on where you are in, in the world, and to take that land and actually transfer it to a commons ownership structure, a common stewardship structure, where people could live uh, permanently and build movements. And so there's the, this is the way it is. There's a co-op that purchases properties. There's tenants who are also owners in the system um, who actually, they, they lease um, uh, in this model their, uh, their, their housing, but 99 year automatically renewable leases that confer the rights of ownership. So it's, it has a lot of what is in the notion of ownership, um, but these leases actually build, and they build equity in those leases so that they have this asset and wealth building um, as, as tenant owners in the co-op um, and, and they can transfer and they could sell and there's mobility and all those things, but there are limitations. It's not, it, it takes housing off of the speculative uh, market and into permanent affordability, permanent stewardship. And it's a very important model. Um, and that's an example of a next economy organization that's trying to be as whole in its design and its operations as is possible. Um, so I'm going to pause for again and see Sean, Aaron, anything coming up in the chat? Oh, I see Andrew is on the call as well. Andrew? I guess I'm also remiss. Uh, uh, Aaron had a chance to uh, introduce herself and in, uh, when the internet dropped, I, I forgot to take a moment to share who I am. Uh, I'm Kevin Bayuk. I'm one of the uh, worker owners at Lyft Economy. Sean Barry is also on this call. Um, Sean, do you want to introduce yourself or say hello? Hi, everybody. Sean Barry. Uh, I'm um, uh, dialing in today from the Hudson Valley of New York. And uh, yeah, very happy to be here with you all and my, my Lyft partners. Um, is, is Andrew on as well? I think so. Andrew, I'm do you on, have the yeah. audio? Um, I'm interested Andrew. in the video, but I'm, I'm waving to everyone. Hello. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, in Oakland and um, yeah, happy to feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Um, my email address is andrew at lifteconomy.com just in case. Uh, yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Sean. Um, I wanted to go through a couple more things and then, Sean, I want to hand it over to you to maybe share with us a template the, the, as an example of one of the uh, types of templates that uh, all of a reference that we have that we share in the training. And it's a good one to kind of give an overview of how Lyft Economy thinks about kind of structurally operating structure of next economy organizations. Uh, but some common mistakes that we said we mentioned um, in, in coming to this webinar, we see this a lot where there's um, this urgency to access resources because a lot of the novelty in starting new organizations from a different set of values 
it's like it's many, many people come to us say, we're, I'm looking for resources, I wanna raise capital. Um, and I wanna raise venture capital is often a common um, refrain. And we um, are frequently kind of trying to intersect in that conversation and make sure that there's literacy of what the alternatives are and develop a strategy so that resources can be best utilized to create the outcomes while maintaining the values that you're bringing to your intention to bring your gifts to the world. And um, it's just something that's super common for us to see a, a huge degree of missteps that are rather challenging to undo, um, but, but, but possible. Um, uh, others, common mistakes, uh, mistakes, you know, in, in, in the spirit of embracing mistakes, mistakes, are, I'm not saying they're bad. These are, you know, mistakes are um, how we learn and, and, and grow and, are, and by common, they're really common and this is all okay. Uh, but we find a lot of organizations that have uh, divergence in the vision and their goals and what they actually want to achieve because it's all implicit. It's all inside rather than outside. In other words, it hasn't been articulated and shared and aligned. Uh, similarly, the goals are sometimes um, used either as destinations, like I have to achieve that goal, rather than as directions. Um, uh, or the goals are kind of, you know, unspecified and uh, implicit. Uh, culture, all of reference that, so I won't, won't belabor that one, but we, we, within culture, we find that um, so many organizations struggle, not because they don't have brilliance in the gifts that they want to bring, the vision, the goods or services that they want to create, Many times it comes down to the skills of communicating, communicating with partners, with customers, with potential uh, funders or um, uh, other team members. Um, and communication skills are uh, tragically marginalized in uh, business as usual culture. And so we put a pretty significant emphasis on communication throughout the MBA training. And then just one other common mistake that I just want to bring up is there's a huge amount of frustration we find in, in entrepreneurs if starting next economy organizations because they say the world needs this thing, this, the world needs this, and that they're right, or uh, as far as we could tell, they're correct. Um, but those needs are not always recognized as what we call known needs. Um, and there's, a, there's this big dilemma of attempting to uh, sell or produce or give known uh, needs what the world needs when it doesn't see itself as needing it yet um, as it's not known and so there's a whole set of exercises we go through around strategy to kind of transfer uh, needs into known needs and it has massive implications for uh, the core value proposition uh, of early stage organizations and how they approach things. And we hope it enables for a lot of relief of the frustration that a lot of entrepreneurs and early stage organizations feel uh, while being enabled, enabling them to maintain their values. Um, and we'll come to these, I think, uh, as Sean shares the um, uh, template. Sean, do you want me to share my screen or do you want to share your screen for the template? Um, thanks, Kevin. Uh, maybe I'll try uh, sharing my screen, um, but just, uh, you know, holler at me if I'm going on too long or if there's some good questions coming up. Um, but with that, I'll go ahead and share here. So uh, this is um, one of the core templates that we use. We call it org design for short, organizational design. Um, and I guess just a little bit of the uh, origin of this and, and also you know, relates to um, our, our core uh, focus or one of our core focus at Lyft Economy is um, looking for the patterns that are common to any organization. So we're, we're less concerned, uh, you know, with how you interface with the government, if it's a nonprofit or it's a collective or it's a, a, a benefit corporation or whatever the entity might be. Um, we see all these entities as having the same set of basic functions that they need to address. Uh, and so we've created this, um, we, we've compiled some of these patterns uh, and principles into this org design document uh, as a way to 
help these organizations um, uh, satisfy some of the, the basic business elements that we have observed that they're going to need to grow and develop. So um, let's see, we have the, the principles here that Kevin just showed us. Um, uh, here is a, an org chart that um, uh, is one of the, the core frameworks that we use. And it's not, not uh, you know, tremendously um, innovative here. Uh, many, many organizations have a chart like this. Um, but one thing that we've, we found when we were working with a lot of these next economy organizations is that they, they didn't have a chart like this. Or maybe what was more common um, or what we see sometimes is uh, like who's in the organization and uh, there's a reporting hierarchy. You know, like the owner takes reports from the two managers and they take the report from the rest of the staff, something like that. Uh, what this chart attempts to do is find a place in the organization for any task that's going to come up at any stage uh, in the development of the organization. And so we have these three basic levels, uh, design level, revenue, or an admin level. And I'll point out a couple things here that are different, but in general, you would see this at a, you know, a business 101 uh, a class. Um, but what, a couple things are different. One is we use this word design instead of what might typically be um, described as management. Uh, and we do that to uh, really reinforce this idea of iterative design, uh, human-centered design, um, where we're, we're saying, like, look, we don't know exactly how this is going to go. Kevin mentioned the idea of a goal being a direction rather than a, an imperative. Um, and so uh, with the design level of the organization, we're kind of steering the ship towards our vision and, and, and values. Uh, and then we're exploring strategies. We're really trying things out until we get some traction. Uh, and then when we get some traction, we're putting uh, operational systems around those things. Um, so that's just a, a kind of a, um, you know, one aspect of what's, what's unique about our approach here. The, the other, on this chart, the other thing that's uh, maybe unique is um, this uh, culture area um, would maybe mostly be seen uh, down under admin and be called HR uh, for human resources. Um, and we think this is a really important shift is to put it basically way up at the top of the stack and say uh, your vision and culture are basically your navigational pole stars for decision making. Uh, they become a real uh, a live tool in the organization and if the if the vision and culture are well understood and aligned and they're articulated, uh, they're invested in, uh, they're discussed, uh, we can use that as a tool and, and push decision making and responsibility all out into the organization so each individual is empowered with an understanding of those things and can make decisions accordingly. Um, and so that's, that's an important distinction. Uh, John, maybe you could just preview, uh, just watching time, I want to make sure we have enough time for questions. We might have enough time to go through more. Mm -hmm. Just kind of briefly, kind of maybe show the maybe the labor breakdown, just even mm -hmm. visually, and then the design yeah. checklist. Right. I think yeah. sure the design checklist might be uh, a good outcome to see what next steps anybody who just joined this call, maybe they're not even interested in the MBA training, but they want to know what what would be next for me. Great. Uh, as an entrepreneur, it might be helpful. Yeah. Thanks, Kevin. Um, and it, just real quick before we leave this, so this is uh, also it shows you uh, basically. Everything that happens in the organization could fit into one of these boxes. And then you can also see a lead and support. So it's a means of assigning responsibility or delegating responsibility and authority in those areas. Um, on our labor chart, we see that same taxonomy, that same breakdown, that same structure. Uh, but we're putting a percentage of the labor in the organization to each area. And so you can see this chart here where the, the green is the the the, the large majority uh, is in that revenue cycle. Uh, and you can see the blue is a decent chunk and that yellow is this little sliver. Um, but that, and we have it here at 5%, uh, but that's so important. Um, Bucky Fuller, a, a systems designer from last century, he used the, the term trim tab, right? The trim tab is this little tab on the end of a rudder of a big boat, right? So before this huge boat turns, you turn the trim 
you turn the trim tab, then the rudder turns, then the boat turns, right? So the idea here is this design layer investing in the vision and the culture and the strategy is this trim tab function, this high leverage function for the future growth and development of the organization. Um, and there's a massive, massive difference between a 5% investment that we're showing here and a half a percent or a 1% investment, which is kind of, kind of what we typically see in organizations that aren't consciously uh, investing in the design level. Um, and this is just a, a, a general uh, or a, a maybe an average uh, estimation of what we would uh, expect an organization to be doing. But of course, according to their own stage and development and what they're going through, those, those numbers would change on a, on a, um, a given basis, time basis. So I'm just moving along here. Here's the design checklist. So we're zooming in to that design layer. And uh, this, this list here is kind of unpacking what are the major uh, projects or project areas that we want to see an organization develop. And specifically by this color coding, according to their stage of development. And again, we're, we're working with, you know, kind of a general pattern of, you know, 150 or 200 or so organizations we've worked with in the past decade. Uh, but each one is going to have its own nuance. But just real quickly, if you're in feasibility, which we would also call a startup, um, we're kind of searching for a business model. We're searching for a repeatable sales pattern that we can uh, um, use to justify uh, investing more in the organization. So what's this kind of critical path? Well, we need a little bit of a, a, a vision. Um, you need some people, this, uh, recruiting and hiring. Um, you need to maybe understand what's going on in the market and industry. Uh, and then this strategic positioning, um, we won't go too deep into it here, but tucked inside here is the, the product and service design. You know, what exactly are you offering to the marketplace? And this is one of these uh, kind of key areas where we see um, it clicks or it doesn't. You know, Kevin talked about the needs versus known needs. Um, you know, if you present your product, your your value proposition uh, to the, the the target market you've identified, they either they get it or they don't. They 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 buy it. They they recognize it as self evidently valuable or not. And so this is where we kind of see um, you know being able to move from feasibility into the next stage we call proof of concept. Um, okay. So maybe we should maybe we should wrap up there, Sean. I just wanted to highlight that these uh, um, stages of development, or these tasks within each stage of development, uh, there's templates that we offer in the MBA training that enable one, depending on if you're, again, in an organization or starting an organization where you can download those templates, adapt them to your needs. And we kind of assign those throughout the nine months as um, uh, uh, extra fun. We, we don't have the word homework in our vocabulary because too many people are suffering the, in therapy and, you know, just homework has a very pejorative cultural connotation. So there's a lot of extra fun that's out there that we assign. And so we have a bunch of templates that come through. So I'm, I'm thinking, Sean, maybe we can close out uh, of the, and we can come back. Uh, but right now I'd love to maybe turn to um, Q and A. Aaron, do you want to? Yeah, I see you have a prompt there. Do you want to um, verbalize that one? Um, yeah, this is just yeah, this is just to get a pulse check and sort of get you starting to become more interactive. We are moving into question and answer, and we have some questions that are already queued up from some folks that um, emailed their questions in advance that weren't able to make it on the webinar. Um, but just wanting to to also see what's coming up for you right now. Um, the folks on the webinar, if questions are emerging for you, um, and if not, we can we can share some of these. These are really good questions that we've been emailed, um, and some of you on the webinar have have messaged me um, individually as well. And feel free to either type in the chat or if you want to vocalize your question, that's fine too. Why don't we take the first one, Aaron, that came in uh, before the webinar and then model the pattern. Great. Great. So the first question um, is, I'm working towards a longer term goal of um, building up my skill set to offer technical assistance with the, within the cooperative and solidarity, solidarity economy ecosystem. Is this program focused more towards people who are starting up their own enterprise? Or does the training also offer trans 
tangible, transferable um, skills that could be useful for consultants or advisors. And um, I have I have some thoughts, but Kevin, if you want to, or Sean, want to take it? I'll follow your lead. Okay, so my, my first thought is that um, <clears throat> one of the kind of mindset approaches that um, I like to take on when kind of when I'm looking at the overwhelm of the crises that are facing our planet in terms of ecosystem crises, um, people, people ecosystems, the, the, um, just the flaws in our ability to care for all people, all individuals on this planet. Um, I do like to take a mindset of, okay, this is how do I build an ecosystem of collaborators to help in this transformation. So it's not just me taking on um, all the work to change the system alone. And, and I, the reason I bring that up, it might seem obvious or, or inevitable that it needs to be all of us, but we see so many times um, this, this sort of co competition, even within sort of solidarity or cooperative um, realm. And so um, the answer is we need more of you out there consulting, advising, and we have seen that pattern of people taking our MBA and then reteaching this stuff in their own place-based community. Um, we've seen people do workshops for their community that are um, heavily influenced by some of the curriculum, and we embrace that. We love that. That's you know sincere flattery and and solidarity with us and our work because. You know, we can't be um, in all places at once. And so we, we appreciate that and, and encourage that. And we've, we've seen it as a pattern being useful for folks um, in helping them to, to build their consulting and advising um, uh, practices and, and make them more and make them effective um, and, and, uh, and useful in their place-based communities. Um, anything to add, Sean or Kevin? I guess uh, on, a on a technical detail, um, this is Kevin, on a technical detail on adding, um, we have uh, the templates that I just mentioned that we'll share the dozen, dozens of templates that will share um, their open source, um, the, the, the Creative Commons license. So uh, if you are a consultant and you want to take them and adapt them, improve them, that is, and use them, that is yours to do. Um, so we kind of, we want to unleash uh, a lot. And I think the whereas um, a number of people who take the training are kind of starting or working within an early stage next economy enterprise, there are definitely a few people who are taking the training to develop their technical assistance skills and repertoire um, to be able to offer it in other regions and other places. Um, so we've tried to design the curriculum to um, uh, kind of fulfill definitely those two needs. The four, the four roles that are most common um, are the ones that Aaron mentioned at the top of the call, kind of a, an entrepreneur who's starting something, uh, somebody who's already within an organization, uh, somebody who wants to uh, be an investor, or somebody who's really seeking vocational pathways. They want a job in an organization, and they want to be discerning and build up their skills to be able to be more helpful in, in the, the, the organization that they might join. Andrew or Sean, anything you want right. to um, Sure. Yeah, I could just um, comment on, um, you know, Again, we're looking to kind of distill the, the principles and practices that can be applied in any, any one of these scenarios. Um, and so we've, we've also seen, uh, for example, um, people who are on staff at um, a small company be able to bring some of these uh, skills and, and, and um, tools into their company and, and apply them directly. Uh, whereas normally, uh, people wouldn't think of staff as being able to come in and influence the direction or the management or the systems or the structures of the organization. But um, uh, we've seen that happen from, from a, a number, number of our students. Um, and I would also maybe just say like, the, probably the minimum requirement is just that you're interested, right? Because it's self-directed learning. Okay, so is, is this inspiring? Are you getting kind of your, your curiosity peaked? Are you getting a, a, a fresh or interesting perspective? Do you feel the, the self-motivation to, to dig into some of these because 
you know, as, as Kevin mentioned with the extra fun, you know, we're not forcing you to do anything. It's, it's, it's only, um, it's invite only, right? So it's only if you're inspired, then, you know, fill out your, your vision alignment manifesto, like Olive was telling us about that. She, she took us up on that uh, invitation and, and got a lot of value out of it. So um, it's, it's really according to, you know, mm. your, your interest and sense of engagement. Great. Um, and Hannah, I love that question too around whether it's useful to have um, a specific project or a more nebulous. Um, and I, I hope that the we just answered that in some of the responses of what Sean shared around um, interest level being the, the probably the biggest criteria for success in this course. Um, so Ethan has a great question coming up um, in terms of, and it relates to some of the other questions that came in earlier. Um, so can we speak to the first cohort? What was their general feedback like? And have you followed up with them to see if they felt the MBA course made a substantive difference in their workplace and vision? Um, this is a great question. And it, it, um, there is another question that's related, which is um, kind of what have we learned from the past two cohorts and how, do we, how are we iterating? Um, Sean or Kevin, do you want to? Get stab at answering Ethan's question. Sure. Yeah. Maybe I'll share a couple things, and, and um, uh, Kevin can fill in. Um, we let's see. So we um, similar to kind of this iterative design methodology. Uh, we're approaching our, our 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 teaching that way as well. So after every session, we send out a survey of you know what was valuable, what could be better, and we we look at that before we do the next session, and we're always kind of feeding that stuff in. Um, and so for the second course, since we had already laid out the curriculum um, once, uh, we've had the opportunity to review the session that we did last time, improve the materials, the resources. Um, one specific request was uh, more examples and case studies. So we've added a case study to every kind of curriculum element um, for as, as a, a response to, to feedback. Um, and then we, I, I, I like the question, Ethan, because it makes me think, oh, maybe it's time to survey the, the, the first cohort um, and see where they're at. Um, so we don't have a comprehensive analysis, but we do have individual data points from um, people I've heard, uh, you know, that we've been in contact. I put into the chat, one of our um, graduates is so excited that he's uh, presenting an intro uh, um, next economy uh, program at his university in Europe that I'll be co-presenting with him. Um, uh, we had uh, at least uh, one organiz small organization, maybe a team of, uh, I'm thinking of Jake and his team of maybe five or so, but he actually took his company through these design elements while we were going through the curriculum. Um, and there's uh, at least a, a one uh, team that's doing that with the, the current course. Um, I mentioned the, the, the case of people being on staff at organizations and having uh, considerable influence. And so I've been in touch with um, one of our students who's basically really uh, influenced and led his small organization of about five people forward, uh, even though he's kind of like a mid-20s, uh, you know, younger staff person. Um, but be because uh, they weren't already doing all this stuff, he's able to say, hey, why don't we do cultural alignment? Why don't we do, you know, these different elements of strategic planning? And they're like, oh, yeah, uh, what he said, we're going to do that. Um, so those are just a couple data points. And I'll, I'll pause there if uh, Kevin or Aaron or Andrew have any to fill in. I'd like to share one other um, data point. We, um, we did, before we started the MBA, we did how to prepare your enterprise for growth. Um, and so we do have kind of, if you count that as one of our um, initial offerings, um, one of the entrepreneurs that was in that course um, is a restorative um, ocean uh, seaweed producer based in San Diego, um, sunken seaweeds. Um, and I'm in pretty regular contact with them. That's uh, Tori and Leslie. They're amazing entrepreneurs. And they've now secured, like, essentially a, a five-year um, a commitment funding from the Port of San Diego for their business. So they're, um, that's one that, that they regularly refer to the MBA and the tools um, about uh, operations modeling. And, you know, we help them with their, their pitch deck um, to the port. And, and so that's one case study 
Um, and there, there's a number of others as well. Um, and, uh, but yeah, that's a great um, uh, kind of query into uh, getting a bit more kind of firm metrics around how, how the MBA is, is proving useful to our, our cohort um, uh, members. Um, did that, does that answer the question? And maybe we can go to Hannah's question here around ins and outs of establishing a collective. I see, um, we've, we've, uh, we've answered it in some chat, but maybe, um, Kevin or Sean, would you like to elaborate a little bit more about, um, how we see the nuts and bolts of establishing a collective? Um, Sure. Yeah, uh, we do have um, a module on legal structures and, uh, you know, a chart of, of everything you choose and, and the pros and cons of that. And um, and I also put in the chat here one uh, uh, an adaptive evolution that we made from student requests is uh, um, adding a, an office hour session uh, the same week, but at a different, a different day than the um, original session. So we'll present you know, whatever it is, session nine, culture and communication that we just did. Uh, and then this Friday, we're going to have an hour long office hour where we don't present anything. We just go through um, uh, Q&A, interactive Q&A. Um, so that's that's uh, another example. I'm noticing the time and just wondering, um, do we want to talk a little bit about kind of next steps and then I can stay on for a little bit longer and answer some of these other questions that might be coming up. Um, but just to honor folks time, we have a few more minutes before the close of the hour. Um, Kevin, do you want to share about next steps and or you want me to? Well, I, I can start um, and maybe you can uh, bookend it. Uh, so the, whereas we're in the middle of cohort two, um, we're getting really enthusiastic and excited based on the qualitative feedback and quantitative feedback. The feedback scoring sheets that we get do have a, a ranking one to 10 in terms of how valuable this is for people. And so Lyft is looking to kind of build a pattern. And again, kind of selfishly, the more people who are um, in kind of the, a next economy kind of training and learning experience for us gives us it gives us more it's more like more resources an extended web of resources so that as we find funders and projects that need people we can call on this network and so i'm starting we're starting to fantasize as a group of what would it be like if there were hundreds of people that we could call on um, and really see our tables show up in every town and, and all these types of models that we're trying to build um, in permanent real estate cooperatives. And we need more hands and, and, and hearts. Um, and so uh, we're getting excited about that. So the cohort three, we're planning to start in July, uh, but we've opened registration now. And so if anybody is interested in signing up, it's as easy as going to the Lyft Economy website, lifteconomy.com slash MBA. And you can register, you know, today registration is open. Um, it will be open. There's a kind of a, it's easier for us to plan our time if we get a certain number of signups. So we have a, you know, an early bird offering. So if people sign up early, um, the, the fee is, is lower. Um, so that we can have confidence to like plan the rest of our schedule in the in the in the summer and fall and winter with confidence about our time allocation. Um, yeah, and so I, if you have any questions, uh, we can make this a consultative approach. One thing I'll mention about the MBA program: if if for any reason somebody signs up, uh, pays tuition either on a payment plan or uh, the early bird kind of upfront and you enroll in the training and you realize this is uh, this is not what I want, as long as you have a conversation with us, um, we're very happy to guarantee the quality of the experience, meaning um, we're happy to offer a 100% refund uh, to anybody who was absolutely dissatisfied with their learning experience. Um, so there's no strings attached to that type of offer. We're confident that um, it's either something that's that's going to be valuable for you or not, and uh, we 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 work on creating value. Um, that's uh, part of our ethic as we go into the world. Yeah, and just to reiterate what Kevin shared around sort of the, um, it's maybe a bit selfish, a bit altruistic on our part, but we see it as really a need. There's a lot of people kind of um, 
trying to seek pathways into, I get this question almost daily, how, how, did, how did you get into this work and how could I get into it as well? Um, and so one of the, the, from a collaborative standpoint, the more um, that the more people that are resourced in the, the, these ways and particularly the, the values alignment of an economy that works for the benefit of all life, um, we, we see that when um, a funder comes in and is really inspired about a, a need that one of the entrepreneurs or MBA students um, has, um, uh, that we can we can do a little bit of matchmaking. So it's, it, we do see that as kind of a, a need that's coming up in our community um, and uh, hoping that the MBA can be one of the many puzzle pieces. Um, and I did want to just also say that um, Andrew um, and, and our team uh, did create a, um, a offering for you. You have taken the time to share your time with us and be interested and be engaged on this webinar. And so um, if you would be interested in signing up, you can use the code Equinox19. I'll put it in the chat. Um, and that just gives you an additional uh, discount off of the current um, offering um, to sign up. And it, it's set for a week from now, but if you need more time to decide, feel free to um, let us know. Uh, you know, we're just, we, we wanted to offer, you know, one of our intentions is to make this course um, as accessible as possible. Um, and one other piece I wanted to mention that is a priority for us, and it's, it's kind of integral to how we see the next economy growing. Um, we do offer a, per, a self self-determined person of color discount of 50%. Um, and that's really from a place uh, recognizing that um, we, if we, if we don't address the um, structural racism um, and inequities that are inherent and um, uh, they don't need to be inherent, but they are baked into the system, um, we're, we're, we're doing a disservice and we're not really creating anything new or anything revolutionary. And so um, if you do know people that um, may be interested, please do share that uh, with your networks and specifically with, um, with uh, person of color uh, networks. Um, and, uh, and that's, that's there for, for we've, we've had people of color not opt into that, but, um, but we, we do offer that if, if that's um, something that you, you would like to, to, to um, take part in. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, so any other questions? I'm happy to stay on for a little bit, but just thank you so much for your time. a privilege to be able to be able to connect and, and meet you all and uh, and uh, yeah very very open to any questions at any time that you might have about the training it's something that we're really delighting in in growing thanks all for this informative and persuasive um, talk Good to see you again, Kevin. Uh, I'm in Pennsylvania, by the way. <laughs> so not around anymore, but, um, but good to see your face. And East Coast. Likewise. What's that? East Coast. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is one other nice thing about the MBA is we have people from all over um, the, the country spread out. Um, and we've even had people participate from Mexico and Belize. Um, so uh, we are also really encouraged to see that, um, you know, because most of the list, most of the list partners, well, not most, but a percentage of the list, list partners, yeah, most are centered in California, but we have two partners on uh, the East Coast. So. Thank you all. Yeah, please don't hesitate to reach out if you have any other questions and uh, look forward to hearing from you. Thanks, everybody. Enjoy your trip to our table, Hannah. <laughs> Give them our love. <laughs> mm, right.